Our next speaker is the Reverend Mitchell C. Hescox, who serves as president and CEO of the Evangelical Environmental Network. He speaks nationally on creation care, especially on the environmental life threatening impacts on the poor and defenseless. Reverend Hescox has co-authored Creation Care, the Evangelical's Guide to Climate Change and a Healthy Environment with Paul Douglas, and has written numerous articles and contributed to other volumes on this topic. He has also testified before Congress, appeared on CNN, NPR, and public radio, as well as other programs, both Christian and secular, and he serves on the National Association of Evangelicals Board of Directors. Would you join me in welcoming Reverend Mitchell Hescox. Thank you very much. And hopefully I'll get my slides up here in a minute. But before I do, I've already asked Peter to go like this when I got to 18 minutes because I want to have lots of room for dialogue and discussions. And I think one of the things that's going to be fun today is that, you know, you've heard or, hearing or going to hear from two evangelicals. Now, you know, it's kind of funny is that one of my standard lines, and it's happened to me probably a hundred times in ten years, is I'll get on the, an airline, and it's an airline that doesn't have seat assignments. And so you can probably guess who it is. And I get on there, you know, first because I fly a fair amount, and I usually take the window seat so I can take a nap. And often somebody, God bless them, who hopefully is a little smaller than I am, gets stuck in the middle seat beside me. And sooner or later... They'll say, well, what do you do for a living? And I'll say, well, I'm an evangelical environmentalist. And they say, what in the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it does seem an oxymoron. But actually, I want to explain that, you know, the important things to Christians are especially looking at the Scriptures. For evangelicals, that is, primarily is the Scriptures. And, you know, for us... It really puts it center when you go to the book of Colossians when it says that the whole world was created by, through, and for Jesus Christ. Not for humanity, but for God. And I think that's an interesting way of taking a look at it. In fact, we were given a responsibility in the very beginning of the Bible. When you've talked about it here, Genesis 2.15, that says we are called to tend and care for the garden. And most of us would say the garden, as Genesis describes it, was the whole known world. From river to river, from you know, the Tigris and Euphrates to probably the Nile, it was the whole known world to people, and we are commanded to care for it, to steward it. In fact, that word dominion that's been so misused and so claimed by so many people is, you know, you got to remember the Bible in its current form, was translated by people in the Middle Ages who grew up in a feudal system. And when they looked at that word that was used for dominion, they thought about it in the same terms of kings and lords and peons and the whole way down. But that word's only used a couple other times in the Bible, and it's actually used to describe how very bad kings cared for the people of Israel. If you know your Old Testament in the Bible, kings' jobs were to shepherd, to care for the people. And these kings did the opposite. And so what the dominion in Genesis is really talking about is to shepherd the earth, to provide the abundant physical life that I believe we get in the same kind of abundant spiritual life by following God. And that's critically important that the scriptures are the most important value set in our community. In fact, <clears throat> I'd like to give a little test just for some fun here and have audience participation. How many of you would say that you're evangelicals that are in the room? Uh-oh, Richard's left, so I'm the only one here. <laughs> How many would you say are pro-life Christians? Yay, we have a few of us in the room. All right. How many would say that you're Republicans? Ah, a couple, yeah. Usually I get that response in groups like this that it isn't very good. You see, one of the things that I want to talk about is that people have different value systems. And it's pretty much proven that people who are more progressive think one way, use certain words one way. People who are conservative think another way. And there are lots of people in the middle as well. And one of the great problems we've had in communicating climate science, and even the problem of climate in general, is the fact 
that we haven't used language that works for my conservative folks. In fact, one of the things that I like to say, and it's in my book, you know, this ain't about polar bears. For me, it's about defending our children's health right now. In fact, one of my quotes from a few years ago, and if anybody knows the former vice president, he, I've actually told him I said this and he was okay with it. Climate change is not about Al Gore and about defending our polar bears in the future. It's about defending our children's health today and being a follower as the God that I know best in Jesus. Because it is a current threat. And that's one of the things that, you know, I think it's really obvious to people. For those of us who are pro-life Christians, and I'm a pro-life Christian in the Catholic sense, in the National Association of Evangelicals, I am a whole life person. I believe that we are called to protect and defend life from the moment of conception until natural death. It's in so Catholic social teaching. The Pope even talked about it a couple weeks ago when he said that, that immigration and, was a pro-life issue as well. The National Association of Evangelicals say the same thing. So it's more about a certain procedure. It's about a way of life. And for me, creation cares about our life. Now, I know probably most of you are tired of sitting down. So I'm going to ask you to, another audience participation question. If any of you have a child or grandchild that has asthma, would you please stand up and keep standing? If you have someone that has autism in your family, child or grandchild, would you please stand up? How about someone that has ADHD in their family? How about someone that has severe allergies? You guys are a pretty good crowd, not as good as most people. About half of you are standing up. Look around. If you aren't concerned about caring for God's creation, you should be. Because one in three children in America, you can sit down, have autism, ADHD, severe allergies, or asthma, all directly connected to how we use fossil fuels. In fact, if you don't know this, it's pretty much a proven statistic. That number comes from the CDC and all sorts of... There are over 100 toxic chemicals emitted in the burning of fossil fuels. The last speaker said that plastics and other things are changing our DNA, and absolutely correct. Today, one in eight women will develop breast cancer. Multiply that by 1.4 for the next 15 years. Boys and males are not in sperm counts are going down. Male genitalia malformation is all up all because of how we're using petrochemicals and fossil fuels in our environment today. We are literally changing who we are as we lack of caring for God's creation. PM 2.5 is probably one of the most dangerous killers of children in the world today. 16,000 children are born early because of PM 2.5 soot. Particulate matter 2.5, most of the scientists know that in the room. A third of those babies die. Over and all pollution, and this is what's really scary. I don't know if you follow it, but I follow the American Lung Association all the time. Last week, they issued their 2018 State of the Air report. Ozone is going up in the United States. Ground level ozone is increasing. 31 million children live in counties in the United States that get an F for a pollution over 41%. Last year it was 39%. This year it's 41% of Americans live in places of unhealthy air. I believe that is unconscionable. And for a society that's here today to have those kind of sufferings to hear, look at St. Louis. It has an F for ozone, a C for particulates. 19,000 kids already suffer asthma here. To almost 77,000 adults. And you know something? It's getting worse because temperatures are getting higher. When you take soot and ozone and add a little heat to it, it gets worse. And it is getting worse. Even in St. Louis, in the past 50 years, winter has gone up 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a pretty substantial increase in my lifetime. Growing season has also increased from, you know, frost-free days from about 190, 195 to over 220. An increase of 30 more days without frost. 
And people say, so what's about that? Well, I live in Pennsylvania and it's a big deal. Because here, not only are you encroaching on the same things where the Zinka virus and Dengue virus, the mosquitoes that carry them are increasing. But where I live, Lyme disease has become an epidemic. In the northeastern United States, 320% increase in the geographic area of Lyme disease. The CDC estimates that Pennsylvania has over 40,000 cases. There are over about 14,000 reported, but they say 40,000. And I haven't got a chance to read it yet, but a new book came out last week. Lyme disease, the first climate change epidemic. Have to see how good it is, but it's very interesting to talk about. Of course, we have extreme weather. But I'd like to say something. The Bible is also a pretty good prophet and prognosticator of things. Isaiah said a long time ago that human beings destroy the earth because they don't follow God's commandments. And people look at me and said, wow, Isaiah really said that? And I said, absolutely. In fact, the first sustainability guidelines that I know about are in every Christian's favorite two books of the Bible. And everybody looks at me and goes, very strange, and goes, yeah, it's in Numbers and Leviticus. And you're only a Christian if you laugh because nobody reads Numbers in Leviticus. <laughs> in fact, I said that last week in, in San Francisco at a, at a seminary, and, the, and it happened to be the person who introduced me was an Old Testament professor, and he said, man, I really like you. You're my kind of guy. <laughs> but, you know, Christians for a long time have been saying that we're screwing up the, the environment. God's creation. Francis Schaeffer said that in 1971, that modern man, and remember, he was from a generation, is upsetting the balance of nature. For those of you who aren't seeped in evangelical theology, Francis Schaeffer was the theological underpinnings of what today we would know as the moral majority. A very conservative man who said that in a book, he wrote that in a book called Pollution and the Death of Man, which was based on five lectures that he gave at Wheaton College back in 1971. We have a responsibility to care for the earth, and we have hope in doing it. And what I'd like to tell you, the reasons that I have hope is because my tribe of evangelical Christians are responding to this kind of message. Because I'm using their values and their knowledge. And you may not agree with my values, and that's okay. I don't expect you to. But what works in America is when you allow my community to raise up the issues of climate change using the values that are important to them. I like to think about it as tent poles, is that I have a specific tent to bring up, and I'm going to raise it up using my values. And if you bring up your community with your values, then sooner or later we're going to have a bunch of tents raised up and we're going to be able to address climate change. It's happening. But you need to be authentic in dealing with my community. Just two years ago, we tried it out here in Missouri. We had over 20,000 people sign up for our pro-life clean energy campaign that asked for 100% renewable energy by 2030. Over 20,000 people responded. Last night, we turned in 45,000 comments to the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, Department of Interior, on their stupid decision to roll back the methane leak standard on things. 45,000. And by the way, in case you don't know this, there are over 3 million children that live within a half mile, half mile of an oil production place in America, oil or natural gas, drilling, transfer station. And it's kind of interesting is that up to 40% of children born who live with mothers in that same half mile radius are born early. And every more and more statistic is out there is living close to fracking sites, methane sites is truly a killer. But I have hope because it works. I have hope because people are responding. I'm not going to go into all the great things we heard in the past two days. But the thing is, we have to keep mobilizing people. And what I would like you to do is to help me to mobilize, let me mobilize my community, use my values to do it, and then we can do it together. 
Medicine and children's health is the way to respond. Because I can tell you sociologically, in psychology, in every study that I've ever read, nobody is engaged, nobody is engaged in issues that aren't relevant to them that will cause systemic change. If it doesn't impact you personally, you're probably not going to change, or somebody you know. We can talk about those in the developing world, which we agree with, that are suffering worse than we are. But to wake people up, especially my community, it's really good to help them show what climate change and our use of fossil fuels is already doing to our children. Thank you very much. I, a long time ago, I used to have another career. I used to be in, I used to be in law enforcement, a police officer, and I, my students find it fascinating to see the Genesis text, to tend and keep the garden. Hebrew scholars say one of the best ways to translate that is to serve and protect. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not on a lot of cities' police cars anymore, but um, I mean, there is an important insight there yep. that uh, I, I'm happy to hear that you bring out. We have time for one or two questions okay. before we move to our final speaker. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I never thought I'd be talking about my research during a talk uh, during the uh, evangelicals, but uh, you brought out this fact about ozone, and EPA for a long time has talked about good and bad ozone, good up high, bad nearby. I have gone around trying to give a lecture, I do give a lecture, talking about good, bad, and ugly ozone. Okay, so good is up in the stratosphere. The bad is what you're talking about. It's this global general increase of ozone, which is affecting crops. And the ugly ozone is what is hazardous to your health. And yet you look at the US, we have basically won that battle, or, or a big chunk of it, because of the EPA regulations put up, put in in the 1970s or so. So trust me, understanding ozone, the general public doesn't get it. It's more complicated than just good up high and bad nearby. And, um, yeah, th and mostly I'm talking about the ugly that's generated by fossil fuels. And oh, yeah. you know, we're, yeah. tr we're trying to get rid of, I mean, just as an inch, I do a lot of work in Washington too. In fact, I met with Scott Pruitt two weeks oh, ago. Good luck for you. Okay. Yeah, we, we can talk about that at length. But, um, you know, one of the rules that they would like to roll back is the cross state ozone rule, the transport rule, which is absolutely terrible. And, you know, I am a lifelong Republican but I believe in keeping people accountable. And one of the things that regulations do is make people accountable. The greatest subsidy we have given the fossil fuel industry in the United States is not the tax dollars. We have allowed them to pollute free will and subsidize their profits on the hearts, lungs, and minds, and lives of our children. And I think that is disgusting. Mitch. Who's talking I, to me? Okay, right here. Okay, blinded. I just want to say that I really respect you for coming here and for speaking about evangelical religion to so many of us that aren't evangelicals. And um, I think more dialogue would be better, for sure, as in everything. There's always some place that we have a common feeling and many places more than we, that we feel commonly than we don't. But I think the thing that always gets me is when I hear about evangelists and I hear about being Republican uh, is that it's all about being pro-life. And that uh, I think the president we have says he's pro-life. Deep down inside of him, I don't really believe that. But even if you just talk about being pro-life, and I have six children, I think that you're missing out on all these children that are living on this earth and that are sick and are dying and that we're not taking care of. Well, see, and, and that's where I would disagree with you because I'm pro-life from the moment of conception until natural death. And I want to care for all those children. You know, and we as a people aren't afraid of family planning and talking about that like some of our Catholic brothers and sisters. But the real point of it is, is that, you know, for me being pro-life is who my community is. And I want to speak to my community, and that's okay. And we can differ on that and have a discussion. 
because the greatest thing I would like to see happen from meetings like this that I attend is that there are lots of issues that if we start separating them out, we could come together and reach consensus on. I know from Vitam and I know a lot of people that lump climate change in one of many progressive issues and they're all or one and I've heard that spoken, you know, ad nauseum. And I've said, okay, let's take them out one at a time. And even on your pro-life issue, let's take them out one at a time and we can talk about them and resolve them. But the more we can separate and talk about individual things, the better off we'll have a great chance of accomplishing a goal and seeing progress. Because I do believe that climate change is the greatest moral challenge of our time. And I believe that is, our saying is creation cares a matter of life. Everything we do that we put into this creation that God made that wasn't designed harms human life. Let's thank Mitchell again.